All righty. Welcome, my fellow computer scientists and awesome engineers. Um, I'm back for the last time. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about computer vision today. We'll hopefully do some cool uh, demos. And hopefully this time the audio will actually work. Because uh, last time I, I guess I forgot to record the right... Or I think the battery died or something. Because it worked at the first part. So this time, fingers crossed, it goes through. <clears throat> so today, um, there I've created a repository of some cool computer vision stuff that I think is applicable for you guys. Um, so this is it here. I sent it in an announcement, um, but it's broken up into three parts. There's an open CV tutorial where we, I just go over two examples of open CV. Their website goes over a million and a half examples, but, um, we'll talk about that. And then there is a transfer learning example I can go over as well today. Um, and that consists of using TensorFlow and using two different data sets. And one of the examples in the README is a really great one you guys should check out. Here, where? Uh, Zoom? Where zoom the oh, Zoom the text, yes. Let's do this. Can you see this now? Why is it like orange? I, I don't know. <laughs> It's even orange over here on the recorded display. <clears throat> yeah, I got, even if I do nothing on this end. Anywho, um, so let's see, I can make this beautiful. Um, so inside the README, I have um, all sorts of things about how to set up your computer vision environments. So uh, the first thing that I think is most critical for any Python development is using a mini conda or any conda environments to make sure that your projects are distinctly separate than another, especially if you're going to be using PyTorch because uh, it's a pain to manage like which version of NumPy is working with PyTorch. If you're trying to use TensorFlow with it, it just gets a, you know, a real headache. So if you don't use Miniconda, please reconsider your life and try to use some sort of, you can use even Python environments, but try to use something so that way you can manage the different uh, environments that you're using. <clears throat> so uh, that's the first thing I would say uh, that you would need. Um, and I go through an example of how to create a Python or a Conda environment. We won't talk much about this. But somewhere here, you guys will find uh, this example, which is a transfer learning, which so conveniently may have something to do with your exam. Um, I've heard, I haven't looked over everything on your exam, but uh, this example shows an, where you can train a model that was built off of, uh, I believe it was ResNet 50, and they use an alien and predator example. So their data set consists of images of the alien and of predator from, I guess, a, a movie from somewhere. I guess I'm not too cultured. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a really great example. So I actually have that here. So let's see. Did I use one of these ones? So it's in a, a Juniper notebook. If you clone the repository using the fancy thing here, just cloning it. Uh, there's two examples, the PyTorch one and the Keras one. I prefer PyTorch because it seems to be a little sim uh, simpler. Um, but you can just go ahead and open up the, uh, if you guys want to do it with me, I don't know. <laughs> um, the uh, example here is pretty straightforward. The... Um, it comes with all the data and images inside the repository. 
And it's broken up into, in fact, you could actually just replace these images with another data set of your own. For example, if you had like bees and ants or flowers um, or something else, you replace these files. And inside of the uh, program, you just adjust the, the variable names to uh, represent those. And then you can just run it and it will transfer learn based off of those email or those images. In this case, uh, they only use uh, two classes, over, uh, whereas you could probably train it on multiple classes. Um, but that's just a matter of changing the parameters inside of the, uh, the file to adjust for that. I think if I could find it. I don't remember where they have the number of parameters or the num the class length. Anyway, well, I'll just pull it up here. <clears throat> so to start, they uh, they begin by importing all the some base modules. Um, and then import uh, torch vision. And in the current version that I'm using, it's I'm using 1.12.1. And then they create the data generator. So one of the useful things that uh, PyTorch allows you to work with is a way to manipulate your data so you can bolster your data set to have more images than normal. Uh, and the way it does that is um, applying various transforms on the images so you don't have to go find more say you only have like 100 pictures of the uh, alien and 100 pictures of the whatever the, what was it? <laughs> Predator. Um, and so you want to have more than that for training, but you can actually apply transformations on the images. Like you can see here, they have a random affine, which will actually like shift the image, like stretch it and shrink it. And then they will also have like a horizontal flip and all these different things, um, and then this is during the training and then the validation. So you can have uh, uh, so many more images ba because you're applying these transformations on the base data set. And so uh, it, what this uh, cell is doing is creating a, let's see, is making all those transformations possible when you load it into this, this object called a data loader. And the data loader takes in all the that directory, that is the subdirectory, if you come down here to data, the train and validation data. And inside of each of those, there is both classes, the alien and the predator data sets. And ideally they should not hold images. Actually, if they have the same images in both, then you're in trouble. <laughs> because the idea is during the validation, you're supposed to show it images it's never seen before, but uh, of the same class that it can then classify based off of um, that information it learned previously. So you should never, that's called cheating. <laughs> and how you get really great results that actually won't work well in real life. So, oh, yeah, go this ahead. This may be more like a general question, but if you had, say, pictures of aliens both like closer up and farther away, is that more like a bigger distinction which the model may have trouble with? Or should most models generally be fine at detecting like you know a smaller version of the same thing? Uh, that's a great question. If they don't show up as small or large in your data set, then it will not. Uh, so for example, if you only have like close up of, a, of the alien in your data set, then in, during inference time, you'll never be able to detect, or in my opinion, I don't believe you should be able to detect uh, any close ups. Really? Uh, so even though like, it would still get like the entire alien or predator just because it's smaller scale? Yeah, I think uh, you should have, that's one reason why we have all these transformations uh, to, to scale out up and shrink it down and try the different angles, flipping it and, and get all the different variations of the image that you're looking for. Um, and I had an example once I used to work for a startup where we had, we were trying to classify these little uh, tokens um, that uh, were for measuring things. And uh, when we we only, uh, during the training, we only had them like really tiny on the bottom of like the images that we were working on. And then when we wanted to zoom in on it, the, the model stopped working. So um, there's probably a, a better way than just like putting larger ones and smaller ones. But as far as I know, I don't, unless you actually have those images in the data set, I don't think it will find it. 
Um, I'm kind of pessimistic, though. <laughs> Maybe it'll work. Game two. Um, sort of along with that, I guess. When you do the horizontal split, would that, for like, if you had words, would that make like the words go backwards and stuff like that? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So you'd have probably to be. You don't want to do that with like text images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to be cognizant of like, for example, if you're trying to identify if you're a self driving car and you're like, is this a left turn lane? And then you do a, like a, a vertical flip and then it becomes a right turn lane, but then you're now classifying it as a left turn lane. And then you're like, why isn't this working? <laughs> uh, so that's uh, also really important. So you got to keep track of that kind of thing. So, um, so th this is just a, a really nice way of just setting it up so you can have more data. And then right here, they uh, create uh, their device that they're working on. If you're working on something that has a GPU, like a NVIDIA GPU, you can use CUDA, otherwise use CPU. If you have a Mac platform with an M1 chip, you can use this command. Um, very, people, very few people do, but right here, we create a pre-trained model of ResNet 50. And that's um, with the initial awaits that TensorFlow has given it. And then right here, we go through and assign each of the uh, parameters in the model to require gradient defaults. And that allows us to kind of freeze uh, some of the layers in the model so that way we don't aren't modifying them. This speeds up the training so you don't have to go through and back propagate on this massive model, which ResNet 50 is a very large model. Um, so then we eventually add uh, se some sequential layers of a linear and a ReLU and another linear. And you can see here, this is the number of classes that we're working with. And if you're trying to classify more than two classes, you would change this to something like five if you have five different things that you're trying to classify. Um, if you want to do regression, though, like a number output, like say like one through 500 or maybe like a decimal value or a floating point number, you can actually change this to a one and then you would do some other fancy stuff to make it regress the value on the output. <clears throat> and then you'd have to change your, instead of images, You'd have to, on your training, you would have a, a, an X input, which would be an image, and a Y output, which would be uh, like uh, a value of some, some sort, like an integer or a floating point number. But that's above what we're talking about here, so we'll keep going here. These are some of the hyperparameters for the training, um, the cross-entropy loss, um, which is how you calculate the difference between where what the image is and what it, it's supposed to be and that's how you can learn hey i made a mistake now let's make a decision off of that mistake and update the model in the, in the future through back propagation the atom optimizer is how it goes about uh calculating all these back propagations i'm not super solid on these things there's classes devoted towards this but we'll continue this is the training uh function here, um, let's see, um, conveniently, they actually have a, it's set for uh, the two different iterations where you're going to train or use validation, um, which is good. So this is, um, this section right here is, describes where it does the back propagation, where it takes the, uh, the data based off of the loss, and the loss is calculated from the criterion, which we mentioned above. And so the outputs and the labels. So for example, you would place an image in here, and the model would classify it as something, say like alien, and then it would take that output and compare it with the actual value it was determined to be. And then based off of the criterion, it calculates some number that says this is how good of that estimation it was. And that is what is used to back propagate through the model, update the weights and go on from there. Um, so that is important. So don't forget about that. Um, and this is just some bookkeeping. And in this example, we can actually run it here. Um, Let's just restart and run all. It takes about uh, three minutes to run on my computer. I have a 
with GPU acceleration, so it might take longer for you guys. Um, but uh, they only have it trained for three epochs, which is pretty short. Um, but because we're using transfer learning, we can actually make it go a lot quicker um, because it's a real pain to train the model, like 30, 40 minutes. Then you find out you did something wrong, and then you have another 30, 40 minutes until you figure out the next thing. <clears throat> so we'll let that run for a little bit. Then uh, we save the model here. And then this is the part for when you guys are working on your projects, which is probably the most important, I think, is when you want to inference the model. Um, here I've renamed it to model tube, so I don't overwrite the old one. But uh, you can read the file um, by loading it in here. But initially you have to construct a re an empty ResNet model here that is not pre-trained. That's why it's called false here and uh, do all the fancy additional layers at the end of the model for that you are going to train or that were trained excuse me previously and then you load that all in from your file here using your weights uh, matrix and then this is just an example of them running on three different images and then inferencing on those uh, right here you can see um, they use this variable called validation batch um, which takes the, all the sets of the images and iterates across them and makes a decision on it here. And you can see here they use the softmax function to determine the predicted probabilities of what is on those, what those images are from the outputs of the model. Um, and then here are the results um, from the previous time I ran it. It's still running from... Should, shouldn't take too long. Okay, I lied. It's, it's not yet three minutes. I thought I could talk longer. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, uh, these are the three images. This one, it was very confused on. It thinks it's mostly predator, but it could be the alien. Um, I don't know how it figures this out because to be honest, they kind of look very similar. Uh, they're both scary looking things. Um, <laughs> um, so... But I guess this is the predator. And uh, anywho, um, it looks like it's finished on my machine here uh, within two minutes and thirty or twenty-three seconds, and it just finished running. So that's one example of transfer learning for image classification. Um, super useful. Um, before I move on to the next thing, do you, any of you have any questions about this? You'll probably need it really soon. Okay. Um, what are your opinions on models? Like, because there's like the ResNet 50 model that's based here. Mm -hmm. um, could you just like explain to it? Models yeah, so there's a uh, whole research papers devoted towards like this model's better than this one, and and this one's greater than that one. And uh, I uh, I wish I knew <laughs> which all which ones were best. I would say I found that the ResNet 50 model has been really robust. It works really well. It's huge. Um, and when it's pre-trained, it learns a lot of those things like edges and um, different features that are important for image detection already from the previous. I think they originally built it off of like the Coco data set and off of millions of images. And so when it's pre-trained, it has a lot of the kind of base knowledge of like what images are made up of, how do they look. Um, Remember how last time I talked about like how it initially figured out what edges look like and then those edges make up like an eye that is kind of baked into the, the weights initially um, when you have the, the pre-trained weights. And that's why transfer learning is so useful is when you have those pre-trained weights, it's kind of already in the direction you want to go. And then you just have to tune it a little bit to get to uh, where you want to go, like detecting your own classes, which weren't originally on the data set that it was trained on. So um, super cool. Um, but back to your question, which, uh, which data sets are, or which models are good? I use YOLO. Any version of YOLO is good, I think, because it's fast and, well, yeah, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. And then there's a, there's always like a but, for example, the but about um, um, ResNet 50 is that it's so big. And to inference it like on a Raspberry Pi can, takes a lot of memory and it takes a long time. So 
um, if you're trying to do real-time operations. For example, I have another thing I want to show you guys here. Let's see. Let's just close this. I have, uh, let's see, a Torch video example in the repository I put up here. And in this example, it's using PyTorch again. And we're building a res, there's three different models you can actually choose from in the parameters for this. Um, you can use the ResNet 50, you can use the mobile net. Um, and then like there's the fast R, CNN, ResNet 50, and then there's the, um, this variant of the ResNet 50. And they have their merits and demerits, uh, but the fastest one I found that is more accurate is this first one. I'll run it off of the base parameters here. Um, and the nice thing about this is um, it runs at an okay speed, even on my computer. So let's see. There I am. Uh, can I make this bigger? Yes, I can. Well, let's let's point it at you guys and see if we can see all the dif different persons here. So this is the laptop there. I don't know. Sometimes it can do things like uh, it's a bottle here. <clears throat> And uh, let's see, this is oh so cool. And you can see my cute daughter in there. She's so adorable. <clears throat> so, oh, oh, cool. This is how you make it huge. And I'm really big up there. Um, but anywho. Sorry, was this program in the repo that you just ran right now? Yeah, so the one I pushed, or I made the announcement for. So it's under. Uh, Sorry, this is yeah, so I have the Coco classes. I think I pushed those up. Did I push that up there with it? Okay. Um, and so the way this uh, works on here, you should be able, when it runs off of each, each one of these models, the detection module under Torch Vision modules will actually go to the repository and download the pre-trained weights that is trained off of this. So this is like, I think the Cocoa data set as well. Uh, but it, it goes and downloads that and then comes in and inferences it. So when you guys run yours, it will um, probably take like five minutes to download because it's pretty hefty. Maybe if that's around the university network. But uh, after it, it pulls it all in, then it uses those weights in the this module here. Let's uh, come down here. So it takes the model and take inferences it based off of that um, here. And then using OpenCV, we can open up a camera stream, a video stream here called VS, and it will give us a frame every time we call this function. And this frame needs to be resized to something that the model is used to. If you give it something bigger, let's say you have an amazing, like, 20 or 1920 or what what is the resolution of hd i don't know um, <laughs> um you give it something too big it won't be able to run on so you have to resize it uh, using the imu tools function and then we need to convert it into something that uh, uh, tensorflow can work with and tensorflow works in bgr instead of rgb this is what i was telling you about earlier if you mix them up then you'll start having like people that are blue when they're actually not blue, um, stuff like that. Uh, so you got to make sure that that's correct. Um, and then this is just uh, preparing your image for TensorFlow to ingest it. And uh, eventually you're going to have to put it on your GPU, which is what occurs here. And then your model inferences on that image. And this is not training. This is just running it straight from uh, the models provided. So let's see. And then eventually we, based off of the um, confidence, uh, like if you change this to a lower confidence, millions more of things will, will show up. Like if I comment this out and I do like, a, I don't know, 0 0.3, then a million things will pop up, which we don't really care about. We can 
see here. So you can see I it thinks I'm wearing a tie, even though I'm not, but it's saying it's at 33% or something like that. And so what that, that threshold represents is how confident it is at that value. And so that's an argument you can pass into the, the function here. Oh, you guys are running it. I can hear it from up here. <laughs> uh, anywho, um, so the, uh, there's just some labeling stuff. So that's just cool. I wanted to show you that. Um, next thing is to another example of transfer learning, uh, a different one. If you are interested in another example of, of it, this one is used for um, classification. This one didn't work as great for me. Um, so I don't know. You know, you can use it at your own risk. I think that the... Uh, Alien and predator example is better, but this one you can create your own models and it will do the training, but it, it's a little bit better at, at describing what's going on. Um, and this one, they talk about how they, they're actually using the resident 18 instead of resident 50. So it's a little smaller and how they apply the different features and a, a very great um, um, comments here on what each of the steps is doing. And, um, fairly similar stuff. So um, let's go on to one of the cooler examples here, I think is uh, very, oh, go ahead. Sorry, 30 second question. What did you have to do to get CUDA to actually run? Like I've tried to get CUDA to work actually for 5030 and it wasn't working, it was just like silently failing. What did you have to do? Uh, so that is, I think they purposely make it super hard so that way you can really appreciate CUDA. Uh, <laughs> no, I, um, one time I spent like two weeks trying to get CUDA working on one of my computers. Uh, it was my first time. And so don't feel bad I'm trying to get it working. It's such a pain. There are drivers on your machine. If you're using Linux, that's usually, oh, and if you're using Windows, I'm sorry, it is really a pain, like really bad. Um, I let my startup, they're like, use Windows. It's great. You'll, you'll do great. And it took, that's why it took two weeks. It was for, and then I switched to a Linux machine and it took like a day. So, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, but the, uh, so the drivers need to be uh, aligned with the specific version of uh, TensorFlow that you're using. So in the README, uh, I talk about, let's see, uh, let's go here. Um, in PyTorch, they have a specific um, command. For example, if you're on Windows, and you want to use a Conda environment, this is the command to install PyTorch. Um, for example, if you're on Mac or Linux, um, and there's also, if you want to use a different CUDA version, and that's the key, if you uh, go into your terminal and you say like NVIDIA SMI, it'll tell you which version of CUDA that you have, and then you can select the version of CUDA that is appropriate for uh, PyTorch. That will run on your machine. The most recent version of Balsa Mac is compatible, so if you just install the most recent version of Oh, that is like a blessing from heaven. <laughs> um, because uh, there's been many times when I've installed the wrong one and I'm like, why isn't this working? That's usually what happens and I spend forever. Anywho, uh, but this is a really nice setup because then you can like choose whatever command is appropriate for your um, version that you are hoping to use. Um, so hopefully that answers your question on how to get it working. Um, so it, you have to really, I don't know if you're really wanting to get PyTorch, which I highly recommend work, getting it working. Um, the, I would say go through the pain early on and then that way you can have a cool environment that you know, you can come back to, for example, like I have a handful of different versions of PyTorch that I have installed. Like I have a 3.6 version installed. I have a one that works on my M1 Mac, a one that works for GPUs. Uh, and I just change it depending on what machine I'm on. But anywho. <clears throat> um, okay, so hopefully that answers your question. 
Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was OpenCV. Before I move on to that, um, does anybody have any other questions about PyTorch? Or getting it working on your machine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you specify it? Yeah. Right. You can usually get around that problem by this command here. This will choose CUDA if it's available on your machine. Um, it also, um, I like to add this one for my machine, but it only works for me because I don't have an M1 Mac. Um, so yeah, that's how you would do it. And then if you're using a CPU, it, it's no big deal. You just use your CPU. And if they so happen to be high and mighty and own a GPU, then they can use it on there. So. Do you ever have any other like commands somewhere in your code where you need to set like a Boolean to use that each time? Uh, usually, um, you just assign it to the device. Uh, like if you, you see some of the examples here, we. Uh, uh, it's, it assigns like a tensor to a device, and depending on whether you've chosen the GPU or your CPU, it'll put it on that device, and you can run off of that. Um, but if you do something weird that requires just the GPU and you don't want to use the two device, you can just have an if statement that says do that or something like that. So cool. Good questions. Um, so last example here is an OpenCV example using HSV. So common, a common robotics like hello world example is to like follow a ball or like track something. Um, oh, and I was supposed to talk about ethics, but uh, I'll talk about that really quick then. <clears throat> so imagine you need to track something that is a projectile that's coming to kill you. Um, that's an ethical question, right? <laughs> um, how do you, if you're an anti-air defense system, let's say like Israel's, uh, what is it called? The Iron Dome. Um, you need to track something and shoot at it before a human has the capacity to pull the trigger, right? And that's an ethical question that we all, you think about like if, uh, I heard an example where like a, um, they had a restricted airspace, but an airplane came in unknowingly. And because of the uh, Iron Dome or some sort of missile defense system, they automatically triggered and fired before they even uh, validated whether or not. Because usually a projectile, when it's coming in, you really don't have a choice. It's coming in so fast that uh, the, the time it takes for someone to like turn and look at a screen and like push the button is too short before it comes and kills you, that kind of thing. So um, computer vision is an interesting part of uh, the ethics of, uh, of AI and how we choose to, to man manage those decisions. And uh, it's an interesting thing, but I don't know why. I felt like I should say that to you guys. Um, <clears throat> but this is not anything like that. <laughs> this is a... Um, um, a simple uh, program that will threshold an image based off of the color values in it. And, and so uh, if you're trying to look for or detect something based off of its color, I guess this is where the, it came full circle. So detecting something is uh, really important. And this is just a simple classical method that uses uh, thresholding and you can use even a bitwise mask to segment an object and even if you wanted to like take a blob and take the center of it and there's plenty of functions in OpenCV and be like, hey, I'm looking for a ball or something like that. So let's uh, run this here <clears throat> in this example. Um, take a second. So it has these callback functions that you can append to the frame and here is my face, and here is the video frame. You can adjust the threshold of the hue um, to different values here, kind of like what you would see. So um, we have this orange 
marker and if we want to only detect orange you could spend a good like five minutes trying to figure out where orange is or we could look at the hsv color thing uh one of these spectrum things so uh the v value is the what's the word for it um there the yeah i think so saturation we'll go with that oh, i thought that was s was the saturation uh, uh v value sure let's go with that and then yeah hue saturation value okay um and so if we want orange, what if we, we want the value for orange? It's uh, okay, between 30 and 60 or zero and 60. So let's see on the, what is this hue? Um, oh, you know what? Whoever designed this GUI should have put numbers here. <clears throat> um, Okay. Turn up the S. Turn up the S. Yeah. Well, what color is my hat green? Okay. <laughs> and then there's something above me that's black. Um, let's see. Let's. let's Give it back to where it originally was. I think it, these were all. Okay. Okay, so high V and where's the low V? Okay, let's see. Whoa. That's pretty cool, guys. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Here's the marker. Let's see if we can figure out how to localize on it. Um, there we go. So now roughly orange stuff is coming in, I assume, is kind of what it is. So uh, this is kind of nice for if you have like an orange ball that you want to find in an image, you can use the hue saturation thresholds to uh, uh, and some trial and error to find it. <laughs> um, there are a little bit more robust methods for this, uh, but this is nice uh, to be able to, if you're doing something simple uh, to get throw together, instead of having to train a huge model to do that, um, so that that's that, um, and um, let's see. I want to try to see if I can get this better here because it's kind of fuzzy. Hmm. So an, another thing that we could do is uh, dilate the image um, where um, it would close in the gaps between, um, so open areas. For example, you can kind of see my glasses are like shining something here. Um, but dilation will allow the image to fill in the gaps or closer things to kind of grow closer together, kind of merge. Um, and then you'll have one uh, solid blob you can work with. And then all you would need to do if you need to make a decision off of, like say you need to intercept that blob, um, you can then uh, take the centroid of that and a track a history of the positions and then you now have a trajectory on a 2D plane that you can use to work with. Uh, say you want to catch it or something else. So, 
Um, yeah, that's a cool example here. Um, I do have one more if, if you guys are interested. Um, do you have any questions about that uh, example there? Okay. This one. Um, I think this one might not work. Um, Hmm, let's try this one. Okay, so for this module, the Aruku module, uh, how many of you ever used uh, Aruku markers or seen what an Aruku marker is? It's a fiducial marker. Um, let's see. Uh, So these are Aruku markers. You've probably seen them around. They, uh, let's see. Um, they help localize and you can use them to triangulate your position relative to something else. So here's an example where they use the, the angles of the marker to, uh, to project something out into 3D space. Um, another way is you can actually see here, that's a poor example. Um, here's a better one. You can find the normals of a surface based off of uh, one of these. In fact, you can actually calculate the distance it is away from you based off of your a known distance. If you've printed them out and you measure them and you're saying like, hey, I know that this is two inches away then, uh, or two inches wide. And when you calculate the normal distance uh, for triangulation, you just need two points. And since you've, you can gauge that distance and there's uh, libraries that will help you um, help you localize things um, based off of your fiducial marker. So this is really useful for robotics. For example, if you want to pick something up and you don't want to train a model to figure out where to pick it up, you can slap one of these on and you know exactly where it is using an Uruku marker detector. Um, so that is that there. Um, so the only thing is it's not provided in the base OpenCV environment. You need to install the Contrib OpenCV module, which is, uh, it's an extension to OpenCV. Um, and this should work. <clears throat> now let's run it. where to it go? Okay, cool. Let's, uh, I don't want to draw an Oroku marker on the wall there. Let me pull it up on the screen and we can point my camera at it. Should have printed some out before I came. Sorry, guys. I was not prepared. Okay, let's see if maybe one of these, um, Will it work here? Come on. Oh. No. Oh, sad day. Um, there's got to be a better way of doing this. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Let's try that.
Let's see. These aren't standard Aruka markers. We need to find a standard one. Come on. Please work. That could be. Also needs like that white border on the bottom for it to detect. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Well, come back. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it gets pretty small. I'm impressed. Holy moly. How is it doing that? <laughs> okay, I lost it. Okay. So you can use this. Uh, you can see it's detecting the top left corner and even it's invariant of the rotation. So that's nice. Oh, that is even nicer. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so these are some really useful tools. And I hope that you can use them for your, um, your projects. Um, so this, this example, we'll draw it around uh, very, very simple. So let, I'll just walk through it with you guys. We first convert it to grayscale because the Aruku detector only works on grayscale images. And then it um, is based off of a dictionary. So if you use a different dictionary than the one that you've printed out, then you'll never be able to, as you saw there, some of them don't work because they're on a different dictionary. Um, but this is like the common, the most common dictionary. So I assumed there would be one that I could find, but it took a while to find one. <laughs> uh, so you, you get a dictionary that's, purport, that's associated with what you're detecting, and then your model will search for those and, and then go from there. And then this is the detect function. Uh, you pass in the parameters, and then eventually you can use... Um, is this a function? Oh, okay. You can use the, the points that are provided, the corners, and use those to measure the distance in pixels. And then you can use that proportion of pixel distance to the known physical distance that you have assigned like when you printed them out. And you can then gauge how far away that object is uh, based off of that ratio of, of pixel distance to that. So. Uh, so the corners, uh, there's four corners of the of the Aruku, Aruku marker, and so there's like top left, bottom left, all the way around, and then those those widths and heights you can measure in pixels from one point to another, and then you use that that pixel distance, yeah, to convert to the physical distance. So, yeah, cool. Um, well, it looks like we're almost out of time. Do we have any other questions? What time is it? Oh, we got two minutes. Right? Is it 25 or 20? Okay, two minutes. Any other questions, concerns, or funny jokes? Recipes? Well, I think that's it then. We'll see you guys later. Thank you.